Dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends of PRIO, um, I hear that my voice is booming, which is good because I have a very soft voice usually. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you uh, to you the newly published book, Small Arms, Crime and Conflict, edited by Owen Green, to my left, who is the chair of the Center for International Cooperation and Security and senior lecturer at the Department of Peace Studies and former director at the Department of Peace Studies at Bradford University. Uh, and Prio's own Nick Marsh, uh, who is a researcher at the Conflict Resolution and Peacebuilding Program at Prio. My name is Pinar Tank, and I'm leader of the CRPB program, one of the three programs here at Prio whose focus is primarily on field-based research. I've been given the task that was originally set for Christian uh, Harpviken, Prio's director, who had to apologize because he'd been called away at the last minute but I will be chairing the meeting today. And I've been told by the authors that um, we had intended to have a book here available to, for you to take away uh, rather generously, but unfortunately they haven't managed to get the book here in time. So I would ask that if you could write your name on a list, uh, maybe if you could just uh, grab that list there, and an address, and um, I've been told that the authors will faithfully mail your copy to you for having uh, turned up at the seminar. There's a benefit. Um, I would uh, like to begin firstly by giving you a sense of the effort that lies behind this publication. Uh, this book is a product of research supported by the European Science Foundation and specifically the Cost Action A25 European Small Arms and the Perpetuation of Violence program which ran from 2004 to 2008. Uh, with a goal uh, to, to manage to get greater integration and coordination of European research on small arms and light weapons. It involved the participation of some 80 researchers, both in institute, university, and NGO sectors in 18 European countries. So this is quite a wide-reaching uh, wide effort. Um, and this in itself, I think, is impressively comprehensive. But I would also like to add that the foundations of this project go further back in time. Nick has for a decade worked on the NISAT project, the Norwegian Initiative on Small Arms Transfers, along with another colleague, Hilda Valakir. Uh, the NISAT project um, consists of a database of the international authorized trade in small arms and light weapons containing over one million records and a document library of over 28,000 articles on small arms issues. And my reason for mentioning this to you is to offer you an understanding of the depth of knowledge that has gone into the, this project by the prior work of both of these sco scholars. And if you haven't already looked at the NISAT database, I actually recommend you look at it. I don't think you're aware of the uses until you actually go into the, uh, go into the database itself. But back to the book. Um, in reading this book, uh, I realize that while it is of interest to those working on small arms and light weapons issues, its relevance stretches much further into the field of international relations by challenging some of our conceptual givens regarding the role of weapons, violence, and insecurity. And I think this is something that both the authors will bring up uh, in their presentations. Um, in international relations, what you see often depends on the lens through which you look. And it often is the case that the strongest truths in political science, in hindsight, often seem self-evident. Uh, one example f is the idea of human security. No one thought that this would trump state security until the early 1990s, with the consequence that we have now focus, fo shifted our focus to address issues that impact human security. And complex armed violence, which is discussed in this volume, is one of the issues linked to, to that of human security. Another example is the idea that women and children are affected differently by conflict and its aftermath the fact that conflict is actually gendered. This is obvious to us now, but it wasn't until the passage of Resolution 1325 by the UN in 2000 that there was an official recognition that conflict was not gender neutral. And this actually brings me to my final point, which is that I am very pleased to see that there are a number of people here from the policymaking community. Um, because in as much as it's important to recognize that the terrain is shifting through new conceptual lenses, this shouldn't remain an intellectual exercise. It means little if it doesn't make a difference to those who experience that the violence of small arms is, affects their daily lives. So that good policy follows from good and solid theoretical research. 
And with that, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Nick. Yeah, thanks very much, Pina, for that uh, excellent introduction. Um, it was much better response than the, way, the one I had this morning. Um, the one I told my three-year-old child about how Daddy had um, managed to make a book. He was very impressed, but then was very unimpressed when he heard that it didn't have any pictures in it. <laughs> um, we'll start off. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Um, and this, this will hopefully not take too long, and it will hopefully not be too boring for those who've been working on the issue for, um, for a few years, but it's to give uh, sort of newcomers uh, some basic idea about what we're talking about. So when we're talking about the extent of armed violence, um, what we're looking at is both conflict, uh, warfare, and homicide. Uh, so it's all violence uh, which is armed, which is committed using weapons. Um, the majority of these deaths by far are located in developing countries. And what you find is a fatal combination um, of armed groups and, and high levels of violence and access to weapons, which leads to very high levels of homicide, which I'll go through the, in more detail in a minute. Um, what that means is when you're looking at countries such as South Africa or Brazil or Mexico, um, which have you know, thousands or tens of thousands of homicide victims per year. This isn't uh, a vast quantity of husbands murdering their wives or uh, sisters murdering their sisters. Uh, to a very great extent, and this is what Owen and I will develop throughout the rest of the session, uh, this violence is organized. It is perpetuated by people who exist in groups, and it is perpetuated often for economic motivations and so on political motivations, to, rather than simply uh, being a large very large quantity of random acts of individual violence. So when we're talking about small arms and light weapons, um, we're, we're talking about firearms, so pistols, rifles, etc., plus portable weapons. Uh, by that we mean weapons which can be carried by one, two, three people at most, um, but things which are cheap, portable, rugged, easy to use and maintain. And these have been a focus of international attention since the mid-90s. Uh, and what we'll go through later is the links between the areas with high level of violence and the proliferation of particularly these kind of weapons, uh, and there being a link between the two. So when we're looking at firearms, who owns them? Uh, I don't know if you can read the text at the bottom, these uh, figures I, I borrowed from the Small Arms Survey. Um, but the, the very small wedge here, that's law enforcement, um, about 26 million. About 200 million here in the armed forces in the yellow, and about 650 million in the hands of civilians. Um, so when we're talking about who owns arms, the vast majority in the world are owned by civilians. Um, in uh, in the majority of countries, um, so the civilian ownership of arms by far exceeds military or police ownership. I mean, for example, in the United States, you've got about a million, million, or, million or so people in the armed forces, and roughly in the population, um, you have about one gun per inhabitant. So there, you know, there are hundreds of millions of guns in civilian hands in the United States and far, far fewer in the hands of the military. Uh, and that's respect, res reflected in the second graph. Where are they? This bit is the United States. Um, so these are by far the, uh, al almost a majority of the arms in the world are, lo are located just in one country. Uh, Americans really love their guns. Uh, second, we have India. Uh, third, we have China. Fourth, we have Germany. Fifth, Pakistan. And there you can see, again, a mix of um, the types of people who are owning them. So you have in India um, uh, both uh, civilian ownership for things uh, like sporting purposes, but also large amounts of armed conflict in India uh, across the subcontinent with uh, um, armed uh, militias uh, operating. Um, China, we're really not too sure exactly who owns them, um, and it was a surprise uh, a few years ago when the Chinese government started publishing information, we suddenly discovered that there were very large amounts of firearms 
in the country. And then when you come to Germany, um, these, of course, are mostly owned by people who use them for sporting purposes, um, so for hunting, pistol shooting, etc. When we're looking at homicide, um, uh, where, where it's distributed, you can see the darker areas represent a higher levels of homicide per 100,000. So darker areas across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then in various parts of Asia, so there's Burma, Philippines, um, Soviet Union. Um, and so w when you're looking at this map of homicide, there's countries such as Norway, France, Germany, in Western Europe, these really are very much a, a sort of island of relative tranquility um, with other countries such as Australia or Canada, sort of in other parts of the world. But you know, the, the majority of the developing world, if we stretch an arc through here, are also areas with exceptionally high levels of homicide. Um, if you look down here at the scale, we have places like Venezuela with um, up to uh, you know, 50, 60 uh, deaths per 100,000. Um, the lowest countries there, that's about a half to two deaths per 100,000. So we're looking at the worst affected countries being you know, 50 or more times uh, homicide than the least affected countries. When we look at warfare, the map is much more sparse. So you have large numbers of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. Um, but the, the geographical extent of warfare is much less. And if you see here on the scale, again, the, this is a scale of deaths per 100,000. It's on a similar level. So when we do this, which is a map uh, we produced back in 2005, so it's getting a bit long in the tooth, where we kind of combine the two and look at where there are high levels of firearm deaths. Um, again, you see uh, the conflicts here, such as Colombia, but also the whole of Latin America um, has similar levels of, uh, of violence uh, to just that one conflict in Colombia in, in terms of homicide. Uh, as an example, uh, we, we've all heard about the war in Nepal. Um, this was back in the early, in the early 2000s um, when we did this. The cumulative total of people who'd been killed was about 10,000. Um, that's about the same at the time as the death toll per year in South Africa from homicide. Um, so it, when you balance the two, for the most part, homicide is a much greater problem than warfare, all except the, the very extreme uh, examples of, of high-intensity conflict. Uh, such as, for example, took place in Iraq. And apart from those extreme examples, most uh, homicide-affected uh, countries have more fatalities than most uh, countries with armed conflict. Um, so there's, when you saw the map with the high levels of firearm homicide and fire, high levels of homicide and conflict, there was a broad correspondence. And that's because when we're looking at the link between the two, uh, it's striking that across the world, countries with high levels of homicide are those with high levels of firearms homicide. It's very difficult to get that level of murder and death if people aren't actually armed. And that's the end of uh, my section. I'll hand over to it. Anybody's going to do a double act? Yeah, which uh, means that we'll be popping up and down. Is this, uh, I, is that on? Can you hear me? Okay, I've got a loud enough voice anyway, but uh, uh, it's good to have it recorded here. So let's just switch and uh, see. So my, uh, this, what I'm going to now do is focus just very briefly on what we're aiming to do in the book. Um, I'm so sorry you don't have a copy that you can leaf through while you're going here. That would make it easier to, for you to pick up on things. Our aim for the rest of the presentation, really, is to outline some of the, what, uh, what, uh, some of the key issues and uh, themes and findings, as it were, of the book. But obviously, like all books, it's got a lot in it. <laughs> and so uh, we're, we aim to quickly summarize and highlight those as, a, as pegs for future discussion after we've finished. Obviously, there's an art to trying to keep your own presentation short in that context. Um, uh, after all of the effort of the cost program, essentially, both Nick and I, who, as I say, as was said, been very long in small arms and light weapons. I was involved in it first in the mid-1990s and have sort of lived with the issue uh, ever since then very actively. Um, 
we decided to sort of, you know, one thing you can't do is produce a book based on lots of workshops and conferences and 80 authors. So basically when you see the book, you'll see that Nick and I have essentially co-authored almost all chapters. <laughs> and essentially, it's our distillation of, uh, uh, and you're co-authored with others. There are other people there. It's our distillation of what seemed to us to be very critical issues about, and this is the key uh, point. Sorry, this isn't, um, uh, let me go from the beginning. There we go. Yep, so let's go are. for slideshow. Yep. Are we there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. But I'm not on there at that yep. point. So yes. let's. Uh, it's interesting. It's not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so the book is above all an exploration of the interrelationships between arms flows and availability, and uh, the wider social uh, uh, violences associated with crime and conflict and societal uh, uh, violence. Um, there's a, a lot of work, uh, could obviously be done much more, about arms themselves and arms flows and the phenomenon of um, small arms proliferation, lack of control and so on. There's obviously a lot of work uh, around violence and crime and conflict. Um, but there's a lot of contestation about what the links are. <laughs> if you come from an arms researcher type environment, uh, the presumption tends to be that it's fairly clear that if you've got a lot of arms, then that's going to create a lot of violence. You've got these correlations uh, that are there and uh, crime. And in a sense, the connections uh, are readily uh, asserted that um, uh, flows and availability of arms make a really big difference to those issues. On the other hand, if you look at all of the research, or a great deal of the research to do with violence, crime, and armed conflict, um, and uh, the, the weight of the research would tend to treat arms as a symptom <laughs> rather than the cause, uh, as an epiphenomenon or a secondary phenomenon which uh, comes out of uh, the, the wider social or economic or political agendas that are there. And therefore, not, not unimportant, of course, because they're the instruments of violence, but in some sense superficial. And those two um, images are um, uh, you know, grossly oversimplified but they do characterize <laughs> two different communities. And so the aim of the uh, book is to try and elaborate and get to grips with uh, where those, how those interrelationships tend to operate and how central they are. So we're always trying to keep in balance two things, the arms dynamics, which is flows and availability. Availability doesn't just mean national holdings. It means if you are in a fight, how readily available are weapons? If you, um, if you want to set up an armed group, how readily, uh, you know, what does it take to get access uh, to, the relative, to the relevant arms to do that? Um, and the starting point of our book is not to prove that those interlinkages are important. Uh, we hope that we demonstrate that, but we take that as a given from on the basis of uh, all of our research over many years. It's more a question of looking at the complexity and dynamism of them and trying to get a sense of what's important and what isn't, um, and what we know and what we don't know. Now, one of the challenges is that the research community to do with small arms uh, and, you know, as, as I said, Nick and I have been organic parts of it. Now, all of the positives and negatives we bear responsibility for alongside other things is that it's been extremely policy engaged from the beginning. Uh, from the mid-1990s, when the first groups of us were getting together highlighting the issue of small arms, that was agenda setting. It was about arms control. It was about moving on. It was about trying to get to grips with human security issues and a, a agenda set on an international and national stages in a range of frameworks. Now, that's brought lots of benefit, and that's carried on completely. Um, it's got a remarkably little base in the purely academic, <laughs> uh, where researchers are working in that traditional social science. Not saying it doesn't have that base, it's certainly grown now, but that's not where its center of gravity has been. Now that's improved things a lot in some respects. It's meant that the resources, the scale of resources and effort and interest and engagement has been much higher than it would otherwise have been, just in terms of the money and resources and people available. It's meant that there's been much more active interlearning between the research community, the policy community, and the practitioner community than normally takes place in many research uh, communities. So that's good. But we all know it also brings negatives. Uh, you, in the policy community, you need good enough knowledge to get away with this agenda setting debate. <laughs> you have, uh, you know, you're part of a complex process. Everybody's part of it, but you're, part, you're at the intersection of a rather specific niche where knowledge, research, and policy and, um, uh, interact. And that can bring its weaknesses too. And one of the ways we framed it through the book is to compare, there was an awful lot of assumptions after the agendas were fully set that had got inscribed into the policy agendas about what these relationships were. 
that could be summarized in 2000 and 2004, which need critical examination. And so one of the themes which we'll partially bring out in our presentation, but you can highlight others, is quite, in some areas, research since 2000 has really confirmed and elaborated and consolidated the understandings that existed there. But in a lot of other cases, it really hasn't. Uh, it's not that it's reduced the significance of small arms, but it's really demonstrated that a lot of the understandings were not, uh, in some senses, not correct, or they were sufficiently partial that they were thoroughly misleading. And that's interesting. <laughs> a second one is that when, since it is, uh, there's nothing deterministic about the impacts of arms availability and flows. It's obviously, and it, nobody needs persuading, it's highly context dependent, depends on an awful lot of interactions. Therefore, those, uh, the interactions really matter in terms of understanding how those relationships work. And because, although it's easily said, there hasn't been, until relatively recently, good systematic uh, research into how that works, then that's led to challenges. So in, com in structuring the book, um, we've divided thematically into three areas, which are context, broadly context dependent, the first two. Those in the context of warfare, those in the context of high-level violence without warfare, and then looking at governance issues relating to arms and arms. But, and here's the last two, um, sorry, my, yes, right, I'm looking at the wrong side, it's not responding in the same way. Um, so in addition to that, um, before we get into the stuff of the book, there are some themes, and you picked up on that one, <laughs> on a couple of them in your introduction, that cross-cut. We haven't organized the book on this, some chapters squarely address one or more of these, and in the conclusions we re-pick them up. One is this issue about the interrelationship between the availability and flow and holdings, and who has them, of arms and state structures. There's a long tradition of seeing a very strong interaction between capacity to control, you know, control the instruments of violence, insist on monopoly of violence and so on, and state formation. And there's a sort of classic image, to put it simply, we'll go into this in a little bit, that any state that doesn't have that capacity is in, is in trouble. <laughs> it is a fragile state <laughs> that either corrects that or is um, uh, doomed uh, to, um, you know, to a very long period of, of non-functioning. And so there are a whole range of issues to do with, and we question some of the assumptions underlying that, which we'll come back. Uh, not to say that that interplay isn't extremely important, but it's a richer interplay uh, than is often characterized, as either you have legitimate control on the legitimate sources, of or you don't. And if you don't, then X happens. Um, uh, it's richer. The second one is really to pick up on the human security theme. Uh, there's a big debate in human security between narrow concepts and broad concepts. So a very big theme is how does the narrow relate to the broad? If the narrow is about uh, the physical violence that comes from insecurity associated with arms, but the broad is about human need, development, welfare, then, uh, then we're focusing on that intersection. And secondly, uh, we all know that although one analytically can focus on human security, all three levels, regional, state and, uh, and regime and human uh, interact in practice and that relates to our governance themes. Third is the significance of the security dilemma. Um, you'll have heard of it and Nick will come back to that later on. But it's often characterized in terms of interstate dilemmas. And the challenge here is really working through how relevant is it in the dynamics of intercommunity and internal conflict and the dynamics of armed groups. Uh, three others. Um, there's a continual picking up a theme, particularly in the governance one, the future of sort of arms control, if you want to call it that. Uh, all of the theories of arms control uh, that were dominant until the mid-1990s theorized that there would be no conventional arms control in a multipolar world. And obviously, we know that there has been um, around uh, um, uh, anti-personnel landmines, small arms, and cluster munitions, and so on, around humanitarian and developmental agendas. And that's interesting. And the challenge is how to sort of uh, uh, partly understand that, but how to elaborate and link that with uh, further development of international governance in these areas. And finally, and uh, sorry, finally, the multi-level governance, which I, I won't talk about here, but how that interplay works when you're worried about tra complex cross-cutting transnational issues like arms availability. And finally, and maybe this, um, you know, is just obvious, it's in the primary, uh, um, in the way we frame the initial focus of the book. Um, this polarization, are arms a symptom or a cause, <laughs> is you know, just to misunderstand almost anything to do with how uh, technologies relate to society. Uh, you know, this, uh, 
Uh, it's well known that if you're talking about refrigeration or aircraft dynamics or, uh, you know, or almost any technology is highly socially embedded in the dynamics in with which it's, um, the technologies associated with it, which are the hard technologies but also the soft technologies of how they're managed and used, are highly socially embedded and we want to elaborate on that. So with that, we now move into um, our next phase, uh, which is to just quickly summarize, uh, having highlighted the themes, some of those... Um, Oops, let me just uh, go back. I think I've. Um, do you want to manage that one? Yeah, okay. There we are. And then over to you, Nick. So okay. Thank you very much, Owen. And what we'll do now is um, go into more detail on some of these themes that, um, that we've mentioned <coughs> earlier. Sorry, have I done something? Uh, don't worry, I think it's fine. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so, I'll be talking about um, uh, sort of arms warfare and homicide. And um, so we're looking at, when we're talking about warfare, we're looking at large scale organized violence um, with a political motive. Um, and Certainly, uh, for the last few decades, civil war has been the most prevalent form of warfare, that one state invading another actually happens extremely rarely. Um, there was, there, in terms of civil warfare and arms, there's a large contrast uh, before and after 1945. Before 1945, most of the currently developing world outside Latin America uh, was uh, under the control of imperial colonialist powers. Uh, they entrenched their control um, by establishing uh, monopolies on the use of firearms, particularly automatic weapons, uh, artillery. Uh, there's a famous poem by Belloc uh, which concludes um, uh, that you don't, have, uh, you don't have to worry because we have the Maxim gun and they do not. Um, simply possession of these weapons enabled very small very small numbers of Europeans to control uh, vast quantities of people in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, when, after 1945, you had a period of decolonization, uh, then during the Cold War, you had superpowers and their allies arming proxies. And that governmental control over particularly the weapons which were used by military forces, such as particularly automatic weapons or rocket launchers, grenades, etc. Uh, was completely eroded. Um, so by the 1980s, um, pretty much any non-state group uh, around the world could get enormous supplies of weapons from either the USA or the USR, depending on who they happened to be fighting or who they wanted to, uh, to court. Uh, so we saw during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, an enormous uh, flood of arms into societies, which really hadn't existed before. Um, and then into the 90s, after the end of the Cold War, what you saw uh, was black market trafficking, um, kind of picking up the slack where the superpower donations had left off. But you also still had uh, very large uh, supplies by governments um, who were arming countries uh, in neighboring um, areas. The second effect is um, on the duration, extent, and outcome. Um, uh, and these are fairly obvious points. If, um, uh, if parties can't get, get hold of arms and ammunition, uh, they're not able to fight very longer. Uh, second, the arms flows uh, influence how large the conflict can be, how many combatants can be fielded, and also the outcome um, in terms of if, if you have uh, one side is able to get an advantage in arms acquisition, it's more likely to win. Uh, especially important, uh, and we go into this in greater detail in the book, is the number of casualties. Uh, and that's directly related to the technology uh, of, of killing that's involved. Um, uh, in some conflicts, you find a preponderance of people are actually uh, injured with blade or blunt instruments. Um, uh, if you contrast that to much more high-tech forms of warfare with uh, missiles, clustered munitions, etc., you find far greater casualties the more high technology is used in the fighting. Uh, 
Uh, and there's a dynamic relationship concerning, uh, concerning arms uh, with the state and armed groups. Um, both uh, the state and arms groups innovate. Uh, you saw cycles of innovation, innovation for example, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan with IEDs, with, um, with bombs, whereby the bomb makers were producing ever more sophisticated means of remotely detonating the weapons. And particularly the US forces were having to invest enormous amounts of research and development funds in ways to jam remote detonation, etc. You get arms competitions between groups as well uh, in, in complex situations where you have various non-state groups fighting each other. They attempt to obtain more and better weaponry. Uh, and also non-state groups uh, trying to get sponsors and allies um, from government. Uh, and when you're looking at arms flows, very often there's a government sitting there behind it. Um, uh, so there's an example from Libya. Um, so if you're looking for an explanation as to um, how the conflict in Libya started, why it had the character it did, one important reason is right in the beginning. Uh, people like this gentleman were able to uh, seize Libyan military depots and get their vast quantities of ammunition, of arms. You can see launch tubes for surface to air missiles there. And that meant that you had very rapid uprisings across the country in, in different cities. Um, that, that's very different from other conflicts where you have a small group of people have to escape to the mountains and start there. And the, the, the fact that you had all these mass uprisings which were partially successful in Libya was to a great extent down to the fact that people were able to seize arms very quickly. And then in Libya as well, people were able to innovate. So very quickly, after a few months, you saw things like this, which is a homemade uh, armored vehicle, which was produced in a workshop in Libya. And there was a huge number of other pictures of uh, cases where Libyan uh, opposition forces had built their own weapons in workshops. So there's several myths have been associated with warfare and weapons. Uh, the first, which was prevalent to a great extent, uh, I, I have to admit, I was part of the people who were and spreading it as well, uh, that people were talking about how the Kalashnikov in, enabled the child soldier, that it was especially light and easy for children to use. Um, actually, when you look at it, that's not really the case. It's, it's a bit lighter than previous weapons, but not dramatically so. Um, and if you look in history, you can find plenty of examples of uh, children acting as combatants. Um, so what's more important is the availability of the arms that if they're scarce, the adults will get them because the adults are more powerful. Uh, if you have large quantities of weapons, then they can filter down into, uh, into children. We aren't really sure how many people are killed by which weapon. Uh, again, in the, especially in the early days, uh, there were large numbers of estimates um, produced of the number of people in warfare who were killed uh, with small arms each year. Uh, they were, uh, at the time, I mean, quite justifiable as there was, as Owen said, there was a rapidly evolving policy process, so people sort of did the best they could. But when you actually look at the available information, you, you find that the, the estimates which were produced were, as I say, quite back of the envelope affairs. Um, and also there's a very large variation between different conflicts as to how many people are killed with which, which kind of weapon. There's no global black market. Um, so the black markets only really exist at the regional or local levels. You, you find very, very few examples of uh, Lord of War characters who fly around the world in uh, illicit aircraft, moving arms from one continent to another. Um, what's far more likely um, is that you have, uh, from, say, the production center in, say, Ukraine, you have a perfectly uh, legal state authorized transport into the region, so say from Ukraine into Burkina Faso. And then when it gets into the region, that's when the illicit distribution occurs. So to go back to what I said earlier, when you're, when you're tracing the arms um, that have been supplied illegally, very often there's a state involved in the transaction, not too far, not too far removed. Um, but this, that is uh, a cause for some celebration in that the sort of international controls are, are do work to a certain extent that you know it, it would be very very difficult for somebody to 
completely illegally load up a cargo of arms in uh, in a sort of European country and move them. But what what much more is likely, as I said, is that there's a state complicit in there. Um, and non-state actors don't have unfettered access to arms. Again, a lot of the what people were saying in the um, uh, a few years ago, especially, was that you know there were floods of arms, which meant that you know anyone could buy a Kalashnikov for the price of a chicken, um, which you know. It's actually been rather difficult to find any instances of arms being traded for that lower price. Um, particularly, you know, even in sub-Saharan Africa, you're looking at average prices of around 100 to 200 dollars for an assault rifle, which, in a place like Kenya, is actually a very large amount of money. Um, so when we look at homicide, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, there's a greater loss of life in general um, in the early 2000s. People were estimating um, about 300,000 gunshot deaths per year. Um, uh, we can definitely say that higher access to guns leads to higher levels of suicide, uh, absolute levels of suicide. So if, if, there are, if there's a gun in every house, you, you will find more suicides. Uh, most of the work looking at the relationship between arms availability and homicide has been done on the USA by American researchers. Um, and they found a correlation in that, you know, there's an association between availability um, and high levels of homicide. But the causality, as Owen was saying, is not yet certain in that it's, it's also possible that people who think that they are likely to be involved in violence go out and buy guns. So that's something which we go into in detail. It's the, um, the sort of extent of research and how it, a lot of the literally hundreds of articles which have been published on the USA don't really tell us that much. Um, on research on homicide, there's two um, broad schools um, with very different methods and little communication between them. Uh, US scholars have tended to be quantitative using statistical analyses, but have rarely looked outside their own country. Uh, the Europeans generally have uh, a global outlook, but have been much more focused on producing individual studies of countries. Um, and haven't been very successful at producing generalizable knowledge, you know, knowledge that you can apply outside of that individual study. And that's me finished now. I will. You know, just as we divide up the presentational labor here, I'm just going to pick up a few issues uh, that, um, that complement the ones that Nick did. Uh, one is further elaboration on this question of the interplay between um, arms availability and flows and misuse, patterns of you know, how they're actually deployed and, and used and uh, state structures. This is obviously a rich theme because uh, concerns with state building are extremely uh, you know, prevalent and of high concern. Issues to do with uh, fragile states and the challenges they meet and the dynamics that feeds into their, uh, you know, to the insecurity in those countries, but also the dynamics in terms of the dominant OECD DAC uh, concern, for example, which is now pathways out of fragility. <laughs> That's a, you know, how to, um, uh, fragility being a dynamic concept. So we'll be looking at this. Um, but also wider um, in terms of um, the, the mutually constitutive sort of relationships between patterns of arms availability and supply and control and, you know, and our, our control of armed violence and the state. Now, there's one thing that all states agree on, and that is the primary responsibility for <laughs> regulating arms and their misuse or use rests with states and governments. This is partly a statement of sovereignty on the part of some uh, governments. Uh, keep out of our business, this is our responsibility. It's partly um, a statement of responsibility from a wide range of others. It's a responsibility to protect. protect. It's, it's your responsibility, <laughs> our government, to make sure you do this Correctly. So there are multiple agendas here, but it obviously means that any issues to do with um, you know, governments and states are at the center of the regulation. The why I'd emphasize that uh, comes clearer as we emphasize later in the next slide how, uh, slides how uh, that's not the only story and how important it is to link with that. Um, now, there are these classic notions of the functioning state, which is the capacity, you know, Berberian and so on, so many, uh, the capacity uh, to, realistic, uh, to realistically be able to uh, assert a monopoly of legitimate physical violence within its territory. Uh, this is not just a monopoly of violence. Obviously, no states can prevent crime uh, completely, but it's the legitimate. And, um, and in the sense, uh, in the final analysis, 
uh, being able to do that. And in practice, when you look back over, and certainly over my experience as somebody from, the, again, from the early days of trying to set agendas here, what really resonated internationally and with governance <laughs> was the a presumed linkage between non, uh, small arms proliferation and fragility and onsets of civil war. And that, I'm not denying that linkage. There are linkages there. Uh, but it fed very strongly from this normative notion that any state that can't do this is in a deep trouble. Of course, our state can. We are, we're in good states. And therefore, they can. They're strong. Uh, but there are fragile and conflict-prone states that can't. And it becomes a massive exercise of uh, sort of international governance and intervention in order to facilitate that control. Now, the, uh, we go into these issues in quite a lot of detail in the book. Um, but the first statement to make is that that is not a reasonable description of almost all states. <laughs> uh, um, of course, most, uh, most strong states and developed states in Europe and this, uh, America in general have, you know, are relatively strong. They have the capacities to control. Uh, but in practice, the final analysis never comes. This is a classic sort of Marxist type style, uh, uh, style of analysis. You know, everything was in the final analysis, but the failures came because the final analysis never came. And that's not how things really operated. Well, similarly to do with states. And in practice, even in, to do with legitimate uses of violence, uh, the spheres of state regulation as compared to other aspects of what goes on in violence are highly negotiated, either explicitly or implicitly, in a wide range of states, including states that aren't uh, necessarily fragile states or, or weak states. So there are many areas of state tolerance. Either tolerance because it seems um, within the normative structures that operate within that state, it is legitimate for the state not to have all of those controls. There are legitimate spheres of activity, or quasi-legitimate or tolerated spheres of activity, where violence is deployed or uh, not particularly controlled or neglected um, as part of the normal running of that state's, uh, how it's constituted and how it works. Now, sometimes it's just neglect. You know, there are sectors of the population that you don't care about. <laughs> uh, and we have, uh, um, you know, as much as one ought to, or in practice, ha lack the capacities to control because the police have very limited or, you know, state stru regulatory structures have little penetration into the uh, local um, in social structures, urban slums, what have you. have a chapter comparing and contrasting Na uh, Napoli uh, and, uh, and Nairobi in relation to the use of armed violence and guns, certainly in both countries, both the Italian state and Nairobi, the state uh, not only doesn't have a great deal of control of it, but has long given up trying to, and has integrated that lack of control into the systems of urban governance into that, into that country. And everybody works within those frameworks. There are certain spheres that you don't challenge with the Camorra and the Mafia and so on. And how, it, how the governance then works depends upon more complex issues than simply the power of the state. There's the borderlands issue. There's a big literature now on borderlands. They do not mean literally where the border is. Uh, they mean all of those spheres that are outside sort of classic metropolitan control, which in many countries is the majority of the country. There's the spheres of traditional authority. There are many countries in Africa and Asia uh, where traditional elders and leaders are, uh, you know, are, are expected uh, to be regulating. They have legitimate uh, control, uh, or quasi-legitimate uh, roles in controlling these issue areas. And the state is hands-off because it's part of the compromise between the state and civil society, or it's not seen to be indirect in its interest. There's the use of local power elites. Uh, we often in the debates, and I'll come on to this, uh, really focus on the relative empowerment of state structures and non-state structures of security performance. But we all know that most uh, real states, state structures are not that perfect. They operate in, in relation not only to co common interests, but in terms of particular elite interests and so on. And therefore, the borderline between a, a police service that is serving one sector of the community more than it is the other, and private armed groups that are doing similarly, is not necessarily so great. It's more nuanced. And that needs to be taken into account when we're characterizing how states function and how the use of arms and armed violence works. Um, and so this is a theme that we would argue is extremely important um, not to pick up not only in the classic of conflict-prone states, but in many other spheres. Um, obviously, these are areas of contestation. It used to be that you didn't interfere with violence within the family. Uh, uh, certainly in Ethiopia, it's only over the last two or three years the state has really worried. I do a lot of work in the Horn of Africa, uh, and it's changed its policy about 
you know, whether or not inter-community conflict, which isn't a direct challenge to the state, is any of the state's business. And it's quite clear until relatively recently they thought it wasn't, even if there were hundreds of deaths. Um, okay. So now we another particular theme building within this framework is examining this in relation to the specific issue of fragile states. Um, fragile states is obviously a contested term, and uh, we can get into the contestation, but there's some reality there. We're talking about states that have a problem of getting their act together in terms of definitions of what is their common interest and unified policy, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, there is a paradigm which, again, has been dominant in the discourse um, in the, uh, uh, around small arms and arms availability, which is that there is uh, that fragile states that don't, that where there is wide proliferation of small arms are running high risks of state fragility. And this is particularly the case where there's widespread uh, non state armed actors, private armed groups of one form or another. And uh, in the book, we draw on a wide range of quotes, which is essentially identifying the interaction between those as a primary driver between straight, moving from fragile states to state failure or you know, a vicious cycle of decline. And we certainly don't contest that as an image, but what we do is contest that as the best way of looking at it. And that's, in other words, that's not, a, that's not impossible. And in doing this, we looked particularly at a case study of the Philippines, um, but also more generally, and looked um, uh, a, at the patterns of fragility in relation to private armed groups and uh, privatization and decentralization of control of armed uh, forces, and B, the wide proliferation and misuse of small arms. And there's absolutely no doubt that the Philippines has got every classic problem in spades <laughs> relating to this issue. And it was hit in a very serious way in the 70s and 80s by the global trend that Nick mentioned, sudden uh, insert, uh, uh, uprising in uh, availability of arms and, of course, the communist insurgency and the Mindanao insurgencies and so on. But the main finding of the book, and this wasn't one that we went into expecting to find, was actually uh, to focus on that and then to see a dynamic in which there has been a further decentralization and further increases in human insecurity, death rates, uh, expansion of pri uh, private armed groups. To see that then as an increasing fragility of the state is, um, to owe, is to use words in too crude a way. Because it's very clear that this is in many respects uh, not a, uh, these, a lot of the trends that one might think the states, uh, the power elites within the state might be nervous of, they are actually driving. And they're driving uh, because uh, the, uh, the privatization of security to the national elites and the feudal elites and a whole range of the networks that, in a sense, unifiedly run the country see that as being in their interests, and this network of private armed groups and, and, and you know, uh, killings and so on is part of state st structural stability. Uh, it is part of maintaining control. It's a very undesirable. It leads to extremely high insecurities even for elites, let alone others. Um, but, uh, uh, but you know, we, we obviously go into it in a more nuanced way. But in other words, there are different patterns of fragility and uses and misuses of stability in the way they, uh, uh, sorry, of armed groups and uh, small arms, in a way that doesn't necessarily simply reflect reductions in state, um, in uh, elite, national elite uh, network control. Uh, it certainly leads to great challenges of poverty and human security. Um, but in other words, there are different, relatively stable, to the extent you can talk about that, states of fragility which can coexist with relatively high levels of uh, small arms violence and, um, and, pro uh, uh, and private armed groups. When those uh, pattern, or if those patterns of arms availability and misuse and private arms groups have certain characteristics, and in, uh, in uh, uh, in the Philippines, they certainly have a number of characteristics, which means there are lots of sources of resilience. Now, what does this mean? It means that this focus that is on the driver towards state failure is not necessarily the right one. Obviously, if we were concerned about human security, that um, you know, doesn't make, reduce the significance of any of this. But it means that, too, that when one is characterizing the challenges faced by different states, it becomes really important in a rather more fine-grained way to analyze the patterns of um, uh, okay, of, um, to analyze the patterns of arms availability, misuse, private armed groups in relation to the uh, sources of governance and fragility and authority in that country. And then focus rather more on their implications for pathways out of fragility 
So in other words, the, the primary policy focus is more a concern to do with um, uh, how that constrains a lot of the state building and uh, sort of supporting fragile state agendas that might be worked through for that state. And we elaborate that in relation to the Philippines. Let me just quickly, uh, so I summarize that in that slide there. Let me just quickly highlight two other points without going into it, just to highlight. One is societal uh, governance and regulation of arms is extremely important. In most uh, developer, in many fragile states and conflict prone states, in many communities, it's the primary source. It's obviously not the same as state uh, regulation, and it's quite resistant to immediately responding to state regulatory initiatives. Um, but this has generated a range of uh, assumptions that became quite dominant uh, even a few years ago, which is societies which have gun cultures, which have a certain social, social societal dominance of how they run uh, arms regulation, a very resistant to change in terms of armed practices and misuse. And the findings are the reverse, <laughs> uh, that they are resistant to state change, but they're actually relatively dynamic and prone to change, provided those dynamics of change and driver come from societal mechanisms themselves. And so a lot of the presumptions that you can't do anything about a gun culture or something like that uh, are, are sort of wrong. It's to recognize that that is an extremely important source of uh, driver. You can't just super, uh, superimpose a state regulatory structure or an international structure and expect it to respond. But getting a clear grip of what are the societal resources for that change and how to reinforce them becomes an extremely important dynamic. And then finally, um, we're in the book, in fact, in, um, in three, four chapters of the book, we elaborate issues to do with the governance, multi-level governance, of small arms control. So we've focused on state structures and society. Uh, but the main finding of the book, and of course this has been de facto the main uh, work of a lot of the initiatives, is to recognize there's a multi-level to this. There's things that can be done at the international level and the regional level that can facilitate a positive interaction between societal controls and state controls. The challenge is how to understand those developments in order to prioritize things better. And I'll just show this slide before I uh, uh, hand over to the, uh, to the next phase. And that's... Um, that there is now, as compared to 10 years ago, an extremely complex network of, multi of agreements at the international and regional level and at state, linked with state initiatives and structures for implementation and societal engagement, often programs that directly international programs to support local initiatives and so on, that have really evolved. Challenge is what's the overall architecture if you want to talk about this and what's the thing that makes a difference in terms of what might happen on the ground with human security. And through a series of chapters, we essentially explore and analyze a set of linked clusters. This is not a neat set of agreements that are purely effective. There are a set of linked structures which actually have different foci, and they're more or less effective to the extent that they come together to address, uh, to uh, get a positive dynamic of multi-level governance, uh, depending on whether you are talking about accelerating assistance for countries emerging from conflict or uh, supporting states that are looking for help that are fragile states, otherwise you can't help them, of course, and so on. But in the interest of time, I won't elaborate on those. That Owen raised in more detail. Um, and uh, there's sort of two key questions. Um, in what ways and contexts are in availability and flows independent factors? By that, we mean you know, in what ways do availability and flows actually affect um, levels of homicide, uh, levels of injury, levels of other developmental problems. And how can measures to control small arms and light weapons help to reduce violence and insecurity? Um, and we'll be, uh, Owen will be looking especially um, at the second question in, in his presentation on how developmental agendas can reduce armed violence. So as Owen was mentioned earlier, um, you, you have levels of violence are tolerated in all states. Um, I mean, even in countries like Norway, um, not too long ago, uh, domestic violence was seen as uh, something which wasn't really um, something the police uh, should deal with. Um, that, that's changed a lot in, in recent years. But, and then, uh, as Owen mentioned earlier, you go down uh, various levels of toleration right, right down to sort of permanent control of territory by a warlord. So as long as that warlord is nominally aligned with the capital city, does not try to declare uh, independence, uh, in some places they, they can basically be allowed to get on with doing whatever they wish. 
And then weapons are linked to these thresholds. Um, people uh, can start to uh, acquire and display arms with impunity. Um, so if there is officially a, an arms law which says you can't own a pistol without a license, um, if people start uh, obtaining them illegally, walking around with them on their belts um, without being challenged by police, you know, you, you again, you have a level of toleration there which allows uh, armed groups uh, much greater freedom to operate. Um, you've got movement up and down the sh thresholds requires acquisition of new weapons. So if you want, uh, for example, to have a no-go area in a city where the police uh, don't want to enter because they'll they risk being killed themselves, then the, the groups which create that no-go area need to have at least as good a weapons as the police <coughs> have. So then you're looking at uh, acquisition by armed groups of things like assault rifles. Um, uh, states tolerate these levels of violence because their competitors are too well armed. Again, I was saying if you if you have your uh, if you have your warlord in in a region who's extracting wealth and resources, the state will tolerate that simply because it's too difficult to go in there, uh, arrest everybody, round them up, uh, and, and stamp on them. If the state has too limited resources to do that, it has to come to an accommodation. Uh, and gun control, uh, as, as we'll mention a bit later, is a means of trying to close that threshold. If you want to cut down uh, on armed groups in slums or uh, other uh, problems, one way of doing that fairly effectively is to control their access to weapons because then they won't be able to actively um, challenge uh, law enforcement. You have, uh, in addition, in such circumstances, security dilemma. Security dilemma is basically when an action designed to improve group security uh, ends up being perceived as a threat um, by others. Um, and these occur when states tolerate organized violence. Um, so this is when somebody needs to, when groups or individuals need to take active means to preserve their own security. Um, they can't just rely on telephoning the police and the police comes and sorts everything out. So then again you're looking at the acquisition of weapons. Uh, a household may get a shotgun, an armed group may get automatic weapons or Kalashnikovs. And the security dilemma occurs when other people notice that and they think, hang on, my neighbor's just got a, bought a gun. I now feel nervous about what my neighbor's going to do, so I go and buy one. Uh, or when uh, one armed group, say, involved in uh, drugs distribution upgrades from owning pistols to owning Kalashnikovs, then other armed groups think, well, hang on, they've just got automatic weapons, we need to get them. Um, so uh, you can see these kind of security dilemmas operating and driving arms acquisition processes um, at the sub-state level. And that's one key area that we think needs to be looked at more because so far people have written an awful lot about security dilemmas but only in the context of states acquiring uh, aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons, etc. cetera. Uh, so the security dilemmas can lead to greater mortality um, if, you, if they result in groups or individuals uh, having clashes with each other because, as we mentioned earlier, when you upgrade the technology, when you get better weapons, you end up killing more people as a general rule. Um, and security uh, uh, dilemmas can also intensify. You can get cycles of competition uh, involved when groups uh, progressively try to get more and better weapons. Um, so armed competitions, they're linked to security dilemmas. Um, and another element is when the police also uh, acquire uh, more capable weapons. So they start off with pistols, then they get submachine guns, then they get assault rifles. Uh, and then at some point, if that's not enough, they bring in the army. Uh, and you see army units patrolling with, uh, with police. And, and again, once the police uh, are engaged in this competition, you, you have much greater potential for higher mortality. And this is an example in Mexico. If you can see it, this is in fact a homemade armored vehicle that was uh, being produced by one of the Mexican uh, cartels. Um, I put that in there partly because it's strikingly similar to the vehicle that was used in Libya. Um, and certainly in Mexico, you can see very similar arms dynamics going on uh, as occurred in Libya, uh, uh, with the exception that the Mexicans are probably better armed than the, the Libyan um, 
insurgents, but you can certainly find, find you know, a huge degree of either home, homemade equipment or equipment that's been stolen from the Mexican government or smuggled across from the United States. So in complex situations, uh, such as Mexico, Colombia, or, or the Philippines, where you have numerous armed groups operating, where you have uh, some maybe in outright opposition to the state, um, such as the FARC in Colombia, but also you have armed groups which operate semi-autonomously and toler under tolerated uh, because the state doesn't have the capacity to, to shut them down, uh, or you get some armed groups who are even allied with the state um, the state in that situation becomes the biggest gang. Um, it's, it's stronger than anyone else, but it, it doesn't have the ability to control the whole country. It can take on maybe one adversary at a time, but not everyone. Um, and in, it's in those complex situations um, where you tend to see uh, the extremely high levels of, of homicide. Um, so to, to go back to what I said at the start, when you're looking at 40 uh, or 50,000 people killed per year in Brazil, again, this isn't 40 or 50,000 uh, husbands murdering their wives. These are people who are living in or around favelas in slum areas. And the violence is associated very much with gang warfare, particularly over drug distribution. So uh, Owen will go into this in much greater detail. But to try to prevent uh, this kind of violence, you need to improve the capacity of the state, um, reduce the extent of tolerated violence. If you go back to the sort of uh, the uh, the ladder I had earlier, you know, let's get it back back near the top, where you know no state can prevent all act, all acts of violence within society, but you can try to uh, at least prevent organised open acts of violence. Uh, there's a need to disarm armed groups, enforce gun control laws. Um, again, a lot of these states actually have quite strict legislation. It just isn't being enforced. Um, and a basic facet of the functioning state is to be able to control arms use within its territory. But as Owen will, I'm sure, mention, you know, these, th this kind of prescription isn't uh, without problems. I mean, particularly when you're talking about improving the capacity of the state, what happens if this is a state which abuses human rights? Um, you know, that, that involves an awful lot of dilemmas for um, people on the outside is, you know, do you want to improve the capacity of the state which may, uh, may be committing acts of uh, extrajudicial violence on its own? And now I will hand over to it. Okay, I probably, in order, we'll, because we want to bring this to an end, I'll close it. Uh, I probably won't elaborate too much on that. I'll, I'll pick, leave those okay. for picking up the questions. And let me just, um, uh, again, re-pick up on my and get through to the final four. Um, but just to pick up, uh, just to highlight something which does link um, before I move to uh, what I was finally going to talk about, and that's that the challenge is that because we've got such a complex interplay between the technology and the access to arms and, uh, and the violences and, uh, and crime that, relay, uh, that you know, may result, uh, you've got very many intermediate options. So one of the themes of one of the chapters, for example, is the very different dynamics that leads then to really profound implications for human security, uh, urban governance, and a whole range of things is the difference, for example, between the Camorra and the Mafia, where they have different systems for the use and for the, for the misuse of armed violence in order to pursue their goals, one of which uh, privileges, uh, in the Camorra's case, the need for individual gang members to continually emphasize and demonstrate personally uh, their capacity to exert violence and therefore to be, need to be respected. It's a much more fragmented structure rather than the mafias uh, that uh, tend to reserve it and deploy it in much more strategic goals in order to mediate and negotiate uh, uh, much more carefully with the state. Now this plays through a little bit in relation to some of the points, uh, ju just to highlight it, in relation to what I'm just about to say, but also um, uh, Nick's last point. Uh, there's been a lot of debates, for example, if you're disarming uh, groups that feel insecure, will they ever allow themselves to be disarmed? How effective uh, is that? And one of the key um, themes of this book is that, again, one, uh, it's really important to uh, emphasize how significant it is to look at intermediate options. There is no evidence that where people have a large number of weapons and they continue to feel insecure, they're prepared to hand them all in on a promise, however good that promise is and however high the incentives are. 
On the other hand, there are really many, many evidences that you can change through uh, well uh, through um, uh, dynamics that actually are well attuned to the local structure of armed violence and use to make a dramatic difference to the extent of insecurity and violence that flows from that arms availability, even without collecting them all. Uh, in Cambodia, where I led a program for a long time, the big difference was did people carry them and have them readily available in their homes, or did they cache them and bury them in the woods nearby? Made, uh, they were keeping them. It was an unsuccessful arms collection, except there were sur surplus arms. But then they were not available, and they were not on display when it came to so many different instances that previously were leading to armed violence and lots of insecurity, simply because, in a sense, they'd been put temporarily beyond use, where there was a family dispute, the husband had to go out and recash them, and there was a worry about you know, quite what that happened, so it tended to uh, um, remain at a lower level of violence. So there are lots of intermediate ways in which one can affect things. And coming back to weapons collection and control, uh, the key evidence is actually that people are prepared to hand in those weapons that they're prepared to either see as surplus to requirements, and because, uh, you know, so they had three, they'll now keep one, <laughs> and the best one. <laughs> uh, and then they'll hide that just in case, because that's in a reserve, not necessarily to be displayed all the time. Um, but secondly, that there's an ongoing process. These aren't one-off processes. These are very much engaged with changes in social norms. Uh, there are, and this is linking with this di societal dynamism, where a society decides something needs to change, then a society, in some sense, the agenda setters in that society, they can change a lot. But they won't necessarily change the uh, primary features of whether a young man should own a weapon. But they can certainly have an awful lot of um, uh, influence really quickly whether that young man tends to fire the weapon, whether it's manly to use it, whether it's for ceremonial display, whether you fire in the air and therefore kill your relatives in celebration, because what goes up must come down, or whether you don't. All of those things turn out to be relatively malleable, because the interlinkage between uh, weapons and, and the symb societal symbolic value of those weapons is a much more nuanced thing, and much more manipulable and manageable and changeable by people who thoroughly understand that society, which are the people within that society. Um, but to come on to my final, uh, so that was just to highlight where this intersection, you know, really comes into play if one wants to have a really big impact on, um, uh, you know, uh, on actually improving things. Let me just fi finally just highlight another theme in the book and just make a few points about it, about the close interlinkage between uh, arms and armed violence and poverty of alleviation and development, which is a contested one and one that has seen a lot of evolution over the last 15 years. Now... Needless to say, uh, well, for all of you that are f familiar with development <laughs> aid agendas, for a very long time, part of the professional aid ethos was to keep well away from anything to do with politics, uh, conflict, work around conflict rather than work on it, uh, and uh, certainly keep away from um, you know, armed, uh, arms and armed groups. That was uh, sort of you know, a risky area. And there were all sorts of rationales for that, which um, have basically collapsed in terms of um, policy uh, mandates and or not collapsed, uh, they have transformed over the last 15 years into uh, the reverse, that nearly all uh, aid, professional aid program policy people, as it were, as well as um, practitioners would now recognize that they're deeply interrelated and that's a success and I just want to highlight two points about that success but then move on to, uh, <coughs> you know, to contemporary issues. The dynamics of that success is a really interesting one <laughs> when it comes to arguments that need to be made in the interplay between research, the policy dynamic, and a usable knowledge, good enough knowledge. It was fairly uh, um, uh, quick to, make, to find that cases would be uh, accepted by development actors, not only aid actors, I'm talking about people in their own country concerned about poverty rather than uh, uh, about, uh, necessarily about security. Um, that Armed violence in the form of war and civil war is bad for development. That is a case that is A, easily made, and B, um, oversimplified to begin with, and there's been a lot of research in the last 15 years to show that it's the indirect effects of that uh, violence that have really made a difference in terms of the scale, but still that impact is very high. What did need to be won very heavily between, as a, as a research argument, as a knowledge-based argument, was the case that uh, in severely affected countries which weren't suffering from war, uh, the insecurities and violence from armed violence in all of those countries that Nick highlighted, a similar phenomenon was at play. And there was an evolution where essentially in the lead up to the global agreement in the 2001, the program of action, there was a lot of rhetorical use of the interlinkage between development and small arms uh, by those that wanted uh, to argue the case to 
consolidate that agreement. <laughs> Once the agreement was had, and, you know, on a rather flimsy uh, research basis, basically, uh, certainly, you know, people believed it, but it was not really there. But once uh, that agreement was in place, of course, the implementation process went forward. And if you want the resources to begin to implement, uh, then, of course, you're talking about moving uh, and working with development aid agencies, which are the ones with the billions. Uh, the big ministries are all concerned with development aid and economic aid and investment, not uh, community policing and so on in the developing countries. And so there became an issue of persuading those. And there was a lot of research, which uh, I was lucky enough to be very, you know, very, very closely involved with, uh, between 2000 and 2007, which was uh, investigating much more uh, carefully through case studies and through other things, the complex interlinkages between poverty alleviation and development and armed violence. And uh, what it showed was you can demonstrate it in many cases that it can have a really big impact on poverty. So I can elaborate on that in questions if you like. Perhaps the most surprising finding uh, for those that not in retrospect, <laughs> but at the time, was that actually it's the perceptions of insecurity that make a much bigger difference than the actuality. There are many cases where uh, actually the levels of violence and insecurity are pretty low. I mean, they're high, but they're, they're, you know, more than perhaps Norwegians would tolerate or British, <laughs> but still not that low. But the perceptions of insecurity, if you, send your, if you allow your daughter to go to school uh, and walk along that kilometre, what will happen to them? If, if there's the uh, risks of going to market because there might be gunfire, you might have your stuff taken, really has a, prof prime, a profoundly distorting effect on constraining human behaviour on all of the key livelihood strategies and uh, developmental strategies to do with Millennium Development Goals that matter in fragile states. And where symbolic, even quite symbolic action to reduce sounds of gunfire or perceptions that something is changing, improving, which has to be, which is a perceptual thing. Are you hearing gunfire at night even if it's celebratory or not? <laughs> you know, and, or hunting, you know, uh, or whatever. When something has changed like that, it, there's been very clear um, process you know, research which showed that, that then communities felt able to do an awful lot of things that they were previously unable to do. Now, that has got really quite deep implications for most development programs because there are a lot of areas in the world uh, that uh, aren't labeled as severely affected by conflict in this sort of extreme sense of the favelas of Sao Paulo or, uh, you know, or <laughs> areas of uh, Nepal where nevertheless ordinary people have those extreme perceptions of insecurity for people they care about often for, for people they have control, for their women, for their children, uh, for, uh, for whether they'll invest that hard-earned money in, uh, in something risky which somebody might steal from you if it's successful. And where a, a, a clear focus on trying to tackle that makes a difference. There's also been quite a lot of experience, um, so that was that one. There's been quite a lot of experience of the very nuanced and complex ways in which small arms programming and armed violence focused programming can directly provide very facilitative entry points and, uh, and mobilization points around which wider community recovery, livelihood strategies, and so on can be mobilized. So around confidence building to whom? Confidence building to development agencies. Development agencies are very, including domestic development agencies, I'm not just talking about international ones, people are unwilling to move into areas, nurses, doctors, which have a reputation for insecurity. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's not just because they're more comfortable in the cities, it's more visceral, but it can have a very big impact where you can show that some process or initiative, there's good evidence for that in many countries, Mali, Nepal, uh, uh, Cambodia, and so on. An important focus for community mobilization. Insecurity communities don't feel that often they can mobilize without really high risk to try and improve police relationships or improve the accountability of the army. That sounds very political. Uh, but there's something about artifacts, <laughs> you know, a symbolic act of dealing with the weapons of institutions, preventing display, burning them in a celebratory way or something like that, uh, which, although, uh, which uh, there's been a lot of evidence that as an initial focus for community mobilization, it can then mobilize community and social capital in a way that can be deployed in other areas. And so there's, uh, uh, and, so, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff here. On the other hand, we're, and this is my final point, we're in a, we're in a very interesting, good, but dilemmaful point at the moment to do with how to progress on this, because we've now moved from the policy stage and the pilot scheme demonstrating stage to the stage where, uh, if this is going to have a serious impact, 
uh, it needs to be sort of um, from all those developing countries, governments that care about these things, and also development agencies that care. It's got to be some sense of uh, scaling up so it becomes mainstreamed across a whole range of areas. And there, to be honest, uh, it's proving extraordinarily challenging. Part of that is institutional resistance. Um, you know, you, people became heads of this or that programming, not because of their expertise on this issue, but because they knew how to do irrigation schemes and so on. Um, but it's not only that. There are real dilemmas in the mainstreaming on any cross-cutting issue, particularly a nuanced issue where it takes a lot to grasp. You know, you've got lots of different potential interactions between the availability of arms and the developmental challenges. You need a, a certain uh, quality of assessment before you can get to grips of how best to, to deal with it. Uh, which mean that if you mainstream, <laughs> mainstreaming means really integrating with the big programs, the likelihood is that the people in control of the programs have very little familiarity and use and commitment to really understanding those things, life being hard. Uh, or, and if you don't mainstream and you leave them as ad hoc programs that get then coordinated or integrated or separate budget line programs, uh, then we all know the challenges of um, then actually coordinating or integrating those programs, particularly in terms of the rich follow-on. Uh, because uh, all evidence shows that one-off weapons reduction programs or control programs and so on have very limited impact on poverty alleviation. They can make a step change in terms of confidence building, but then they need to be flexibly followed through. And uh, for my sins, one of the other things I do is I'm chair of an NGO that works a lot on these things, Safer World. And uh, there's been a lot of experience of community safety and security programs, which are a very good focus for trying to get this multi-level community focus, but with internationals as well as state as well as locals sort of trying to get a good synergy going but it's still extremely formulaic and at risk of you know not quite working a final comment is that there's been a real effort which I'm very sympathetic to to try and frame this within an armed violence reduction type concept which is to say it's not always about weapons it could be about gangs it could be about security sector reform it could be about a whole range of other things so it's not necessarily about the weapons you should have a flexible framework but let's nevertheless focus on armed violence reduction as a sort of hegemonic framework, as it were, within which to pull all of these things together. There's now well elaborated OECD uh, DAC guidance on it. Um, uh, there is, um, and so in a sense, the policy framework is there. But in practice, it's proving extraordinarily impossible, <laughs> uh, extraordinarily difficult to use that framework as a way of uh, getting beyond those basic dilemmas. There's a rethink required at the moment, which we could talk about. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I'd just like to say that this is a very interesting, a very rich, um, uh, rich amount of research that's gone into this. And I think it, it shows also how important it is to actually be in the field and to, to heed the concerns of the community and perceptions of security and insecurity rather than sitting at an institute or a university and writing about this to be able to understand the multi-level approach that, that is so uh, important to solving this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here, I'm just going to pick up a few issues uh, that, um, that complement the ones that Nick did. Uh, one is further elaboration on this question of the interplay between um, arms availability and flows and misuse, patterns of you know, how they're actually deployed and, and used, and uh, state structures. This is obviously a rich theme because uh, concerns with state building are extremely uh, you know, prevalent and of high concern. Issues to do with uh, fragile states and the challenges they meet and the dynamics that feeds into their, uh, you know, to the insecurity in those countries, but also the dynamics in terms of the dominant OECD DAC uh, concern, for example, which is now pathways out of fragility. <laughs> That's a, you know, how to, um, uh, fragility being a dynamic concept. So we'll be looking at this. Um, but also wider um, in terms of um, the, the mutually constitutive sort of relationships between patterns of arms availability and supply and control and, you know, and our, our control of armed violence and the state. Now, there's one thing that all states agree on, and that is the primary responsibility <laughs> for regulating arms and their misuse or use rests with states and governments. This is partly a statement of sovereignty on the part of some uh, governments. Uh, keep out of our business, this is our responsibility. It's partly um, a statement of responsibility from a wide range of others. It's a responsibility to protect. It's, it's your responsibility, <laughs> our government, to make sure you do this correctly. So there are multiple agendas here, but it obviously means that 
any issues to do with um, you know, governments and states are at the center of the regulation. Why I'd emphasize that uh, comes clearer as we emphasize later in the next slide how, uh, slides how yeah, that's not the only story and how important it is to link with that. Um, now, there are these classic notions of the functioning state, which is the capacity, you know, Berberian and so on, so many, uh, the capacity uh, to, realistic, uh, to realistically be able to uh, assert a monopoly of legitimate physical violence within its territory. Uh, this is not just a monopoly of violence. Obviously, no states can prevent crime uh, completely, but it's the legitimate. And, um, and in the sense, uh, in the final analysis, uh, being able to do that. And in practice, when you look back over, and certainly over my experience as somebody from, the, again, from the early days of trying to set agendas here, what really resonated internationally and with governance <laughs> was the a presumed linkage between non, uh, small arms proliferation and fragility and onsets of civil war. And that, I'm not denying that linkage. There are linkages there. Uh, but it fed very strongly from this normative notion that any state that can't do this is in a deep trouble. Of course, our state can. We are, we're in good states. And therefore, they can. They're strong. Uh, but there are fragile and conflict-prone states that can't. And it becomes a massive exercise of uh, sort of international governance and intervention in order to facilitate that control. Now, the, uh, we go into these issues in quite a lot of detail in the book. Um, but the first statement to make is that that is not a reasonable description of almost all states. <laughs> uh, um, of course, most, uh, most strong states and developed states in Europe and this, uh, America in general have, you know, are relatively strong. They have the capacities to control. Uh, but in practice, the final analysis never comes. This is a classic sort of Marxist type style, uh, uh, style of analysis. You know, everything was in the final analysis, but the failures came because the final analysis never came. And that's not how things really operated. Well, similarly to do with states. And in practice, even in, to do with legitimate uses of violence, uh, the spheres of state regulation as compared to other aspects of what goes on in violence are highly negotiated, either explicitly or implicitly, in a wide range of states, including states that aren't uh, necessarily fragile states or, or weak states. So there are many areas of state tolerance. Either tolerance because it seems um, within the normative structures that operate within that state, it is legitimate for the state not to have all of those controls. There are legitimate spheres of activity, or quasi-legitimate or tolerated spheres of activity, where violence is deployed or um, not particularly controlled or neglected um, as part of the normal running of that state's, uh, how it's constituted and how it works. Now, sometimes it's just neglect. You know, there are sectors of the population that you don't care about. <laughs> uh, and we have, uh, um, you know, as much as one ought to, or in practice, ha lack the capacity to control because the police have very limited or, you know, state stru regulatory structures have little penetration into the uh, local um, in social structures, urban slums, what have you. have a chapter comparing and contrasting Na uh, Napoli uh, and, uh, and Nairobi in relation to the use of armed violence and guns, certainly in both countries, both the Italian state and Nairobi, the state uh, not only doesn't have a great deal of control of it, but has long given up trying to, and has integrated that lack of control into the systems of urban governance into that, into that country. And everybody works within those frameworks. There are certain spheres that you don't challenge with the Camorra and the Mafia and so on. And how, it, how the governance then works depends upon more complex issues than simply the power of the state. There's the borderlands issue. There's a big literature now on borderlands. They do not mean literally where the border is. Uh, they mean all of those spheres that are outside sort of classic metropolitan control, which in many countries is the majority of the country. There's the spheres of traditional authority. There are many countries in Africa and Asia uh, where traditional elders and leaders are, uh, you know, are, re are expected uh, to be uh, regulating. They have legitimate uh, control, uh, or quasi-legitimate uh, roles in controlling these issue areas. And the state is hands-off because uh, it's part of the compromise between the state and civil society, or it's not seen to be indirect in its interest. There's the use of local power elites. Uh, we often in the debates, and I'll come on to this, uh, really focus on the relative empowerment of state structures and non-state structures of security performance. But we all know that most uh, real states, state structures are not that perfect. They operate in, in relation not only to co common interests, but in terms of particular elite interests and so on. And therefore, the borderline between 
pay a surplus service that is serving one sector of the community more than it is the other, and private armed groups that are doing similarly, is not necessarily so great. It's more nuanced. And that needs to be taken into account when we're characterizing how states function and how the use of arms and armed violence works. Um, and so this is a theme that we would argue is extremely important um, not to pick up not only in the classic of conflict-prone states, but in many other spheres. Um, obviously, these are areas of contestation. It used to be that you didn't interfere with violence within the family. Uh, uh, certainly in Ethiopia, it's only over the last two or three years the state has really worried. I do a lot of work in the Horn of Africa, uh, and it's changed its policy about you know, whether or not inter-community conflict, which isn't a direct challenge to the state, is any of the state's business. And it's quite clear until relatively recently they thought it wasn't, even if there were hundreds of deaths. Um, OK. So now we another particular theme building within this framework is examining this in relation to the specific issue of fragile states. Um, fragile states is obviously a contested term, and uh, we can get into the contestation. But there's some reality there. We're just talking about states that have a problem of getting their act together in terms of definitions of what is the common interest and unified policy, and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, there is a paradigm which, again, has been dominant in the discourse um, in the, uh, uh, around small arms and arms availability, which is that there is uh, that fragile states that don't, that where there is wide proliferation of small arms are running high risks of state fragility. And this is particularly the case where there's widespread uh, non-state armed actors, private armed groups of one form or another. And uh, in the book, we draw on a wide range of quotes, which is essentially high identifying the interaction between those as a primary driver between straight, moving from fragile states to state failure or you know, a vicious cycle of decline. And we certainly don't contest that as an image. But what we do is contest that as the best way of looking at it. And that's, in other words, that's not, a, that's not impossible. And in doing this, we looked particularly at a case study of the Philippines, um, but also more generally, and looked, um, uh, A, at the patterns of fragility in relation to private armed groups and uh, privatization and decentralization of control of armed uh, forces, and B, the wide proliferation and misuse of small arms. And there's absolutely no doubt that the Philippines has got every classic problem in spades <laughs> relating to this issue. And it was hit in a very serious way in the 70s and 80s by the global trend that Nick mentioned, sudden uh, insert, uh, uh, uprising in uh, availability of arms, and of course the communist insurgency and the Mindanao insurgencies and so on. But the main finding of the book, and this wasn't one that we went into expecting to find, <laughs> was actually uh, to focus on that and then to see a dynamic in which there has been a further decentralization and further increases in human insecurity, death rates, uh, expansion of pri uh, private armed groups. To see that then as an increasing fragility of the state is, um, to, oh, is to use words in too crude a way. Because it's very clear that this is in many respects uh, not uh, these, a lot of the trends that one might think the states, uh, the power elites within the state might be nervous of, they are actually driving. And they're driving uh, because uh, the uh, the privatization of security to the national elites and the feudal elites and a whole range of the networks that, in a sense, unifiedly run the country, see that as being in their interest. And this network of private armed groups and, and, and you know, uh, killings and so on is part of state st structural stability. Uh, it is part of maintaining control. It's a very undesirable. It leads to extremely high insecurities even for elites, let alone others. Um, but, uh, but you know, we, we obviously go into it in a more nuanced way. But in other words, there are different patterns of fragility and uses and misuses of stability in the way they, uh, uh, sorry, of arm groups and uh, small arms, in a way that doesn't necessarily simply reflect reductions in state, um, in uh, elite, national elite uh, network control. Uh, it certainly leads to great challenges of poverty and human security. Um, but in other words, there are different, relatively stable, to the extent you can talk about that, states of fragility, which can coexist with relatively high levels of uh, small arms violence and, um, and, pro, uh, uh, and uh, private armed groups. When those uh, pattern, or if those patterns of arms availability and misuse and private arms groups have certain characteristics, and in, uh, in uh, uh, in the Philippines, they certainly have a number of characteristics, which means there are lots of sources of resilience. 
Now, what does this mean? It means that this focus that is on the driver towards state failure is not necessarily the right one. Obviously, if we were concerned about human security, that um, you know, doesn't make, reduce the significance of any of this. But it means that, too, that when one is characterizing the challenges faced by different states, it becomes really important in a rather more fine-grained way to analyze the patterns of, um, uh, okay, of um, to analyze the patterns of arms availability, misuse, private arm groups in relation to the sources of governance and fragility and authority in that country. And then focus rather more on their implications for pathways out of fragility. So in other words, the, the primary policy focus is more a concern to do with um, uh, how that constrains a lot of the state building and uh, sort of supporting fragile state agendas that might be worked through for that state. And we elaborate that in relation to the Philippines. Let me just quickly, uh, so I summarize that in that slide there. Let me just quickly highlight two other points without going into it, just to highlight. One is societal uh, governance and regulation of arms is extremely important. In most uh, developer, in many fragile states and conflict-prone states, in many communities, it's the primary source. It's obviously not the same as state uh, regulation, and it's quite resistant to immediately responding to state regulatory initiatives. Um, but this has generated a range of uh, assumptions that became quite dominant uh, even a few years ago, which is societies which have gun cultures, which have a certain social, social societal dominance of how they run uh, arms regulation, are very resistant to change in terms of arm um, practices and misuse. And the findings are the reverse, <laughs> uh, that they are resistant to state change, but they're actually relatively dynamic and prone to change, provided those dynamics of change and driver come from societal mechanisms themselves. And so a lot of the presumptions that you can't do anything about a gun culture or something like that uh, are, are sort of wrong. It's to recognize that that is an extremely important source of uh, driver. You can't just super, uh, superimpose a state regulatory structure or an international structure and expect it to respond. But getting a clear grip of what are the societal resources for that change and how to reinforce them becomes an extremely important dynamic. And then finally, um, we're in the book, in fact, in, um, in three, four chapters of the book, we elaborate issues to do with the governance, multi-level governance, small arms control. So we've focused on state structures and societal uh, but the main finding of the book, and of course this has been de facto the main uh, work of a lot of the initiatives, is to recognize there's a multi-level to this. There's things that can be done at the international level and the regional level that can facilitate a positive interaction between societal controls and state controls. The challenge is how to understand those developments in order to prioritize things better. And I'll just show this slide before I uh, uh, hand over to the, uh, to the next phase. And that's... Um, that there is now, as compared to 10 years ago, an extremely complex network of, multi of agreements at the international and regional level and at state, linked with state initiatives and structures for implementation and societal engagement, often programs that directly international programs to support local initiatives and so on, that have really evolved. The challenge is what's the overall architecture, if you want to talk about this, and what's the thing that makes a difference in terms of what might happen on the ground with human security? And through a series of chapters, we essentially explore and analyze a set of linked clusters. This is not a neat set of agreements that are purely effective. There are a set of linked structures which actually have different foci, and they're more or less effective to the extent that they come together to address, uh, to uh, get a positive dynamic of multi-level governance, uh, depending on whether you're talking about accelerating assistance for countries emerging from conflict or uh, supporting states that are looking for help that are fragile states, otherwise you can't help them, of course, and so on. But in the interest of time, I won't elaborate on those. That Owen raised in more detail. Um, and uh, there's sort of two key questions. Um, in what ways and contexts are in availability and flows independent factors? By that, we mean you know, in what ways do availability and flows actually affect um, levels of homicide, uh, levels of injury, levels of other developmental problems. And how can measures to control small arms and light weapons help to reduce violence and insecurity? Um, and we'll be, uh, Owen will be looking especially um, at the second question in, in his presentation on how developmental agendas can reduce armed violence. <coughs>
So as Owen was mentioned earlier, um, you, you have levels of violence are tolerated in all states. Um, I mean, even in countries like Norway, um, not too long ago, uh, domestic violence was seen as uh, something which wasn't really um, something the police uh, should deal with. Um, that, that's changed a lot in, in recent years. But, and then, uh, as Owen mentioned earlier, you go down uh, various levels of toleration, right, right down to sort of permanent control of territory by a warlord. So as long as that warlord is nominally aligned with the capital city, does not try to declare uh, independence, uh, in some places they, they can basically be allowed to get on with doing whatever they wish. And then weapons are linked to these thresholds. Um, people uh, can start to acquire and display arms with impunity. Um, so if there is officially a, an arms law which says you can't own a pistol without a license, um, if people start uh, obtaining them illegally, walking around with them on their belts um, without being challenged by police, you know, you, you again, you have a level of toleration there which allows uh, armed groups uh, much greater freedom to operate. Um, you've got movement up and down the sh thresholds requires acquisition of new weapons. So if you want, uh, for example, to have a no-go area in a city where the police uh, don't want to enter because they'll, they risk being killed themselves, then the, the groups which create that no-go area need to have at least as good a weapons as the police have. So then you're looking at uh, acquisition by armed groups of things like assault rifles. Um, uh, States tolerate these levels of violence because their competitors are too well armed. Again, I was saying if you if you have your uh, if you have your warlord in in a region who's extracting wealth and resources, the state will tolerate that simply because it's too difficult to go in there, uh, arrest everybody, round them up, uh, and, and stamp on them. If the state has too limited resources to do that, it has to come to an accommodation. Uh, and gun control, uh, as, as we'll mention a bit later, is a means of trying to close that threshold. If you want to cut down uh, on armed groups in slums or uh, other uh, problems, one way of doing that fairly effectively is to control their access to weapons because then they won't be able to actively um, challenge uh, law enforcement. You have, uh, in addition, in such circumstances, security dilemma. Security dilemma is basically when an action designed to improve group security uh, ends up being perceived as a threat um, by others. Um, and these occur when states tolerate organized violence. Um, so this is when somebody needs to when groups or individuals need to take active means to preserve their own security. Um, they can't just rely on telephoning the police and the police comes and sorts everything out. So then, again, you're looking at the acquisition of weapons. Uh, a household may get a shotgun, an armed group may get automatic weapons or Kalashnikovs. And the security dilemma occurs when other people notice that. They think, hang on, my neighbor's just got a, bought a gun. I now feel nervous about what my neighbor's going to do, so I go and buy one. Uh, or when uh, one armed group, say, involved in uh, drugs distribution upgrades from owning pistols to owning Kalashnikovs, then other armed groups think, well, hang on, they've just got automatic weapons, we need to get them. Um, so you can see these kind of security alarms operating and driving arms acquisition processes um, at the sub-state level. And that's one key area that we think needs to be looked at more because so far people have written an awful lot about security dilemmas but only in the context of states acquiring uh, aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons etc. Uh, so the security dilemmas can lead to greater mortality um, if, you, if they result in groups or individuals uh, having clashes with each other because as we mentioned earlier when you upgrade the technology, when you get better weapons, you end up killing more people as a general rule. Um, and security uh, uh, dilemmas can also intensify. You can get cycles of competition uh, involved when groups uh, progressively try to get more and better weapons. Um, so armed competitions, they're linked to security dilemmas. Um, and another element is when the police also uh, acquire uh, more capable weapons, so they start off with pistols, then they get submachine guns, then they get assault rifles. 
Uh, and then at some point, if that's not enough, they bring in the army. Uh, and you see army units patrolling with, uh, with police. And, in. and again, once the police uh, are engaged in this competition, you, you have much greater potential for higher mortality. And this is an example in Mexico. If you can see it, this is, in fact, a homemade armored vehicle that was uh, being produced by one of the Mexican uh, cartels. Um, I put that in there partly because it's strikingly similar to the vehicle that was used in Libya. Um, and certainly in Mexico, you can see very similar arms dynamics going on uh, as occurred in Libya, uh, uh, with the exception that the Mexicans are probably better armed than the, the Libyan um, insurgents. But you, you can certainly sign, find you know, a huge degree of either ho homemade equipment or equipment that's been stolen from the Mexican government or smuggled across from the United States. So in complex situations, uh, such as Mexico, Colombia, or, or the Philippines, where you have numerous armed groups operating, where you have uh, some maybe in outright opposition to the state, um, such as the FARC in Colombia, but also you have armed groups which operate semi-autonomously and toler under tolerated um, because the state doesn't have the capacity to, to shut them down, uh, or you get some armed groups who are even allied with the state um, the state th in that situation becomes the biggest gang. Um, it's, it's stronger than anyone else, but it, it doesn't have the ability to control the whole country. It can take on maybe one adversary at a time, but not everyone. Um, and in, it's in those complex situations um, where you tend to see uh, the extremely high levels of, of homicide. Um, so to, to go back to what I said at the start, when you're looking at 40 uh, or 50,000 people killed per year in Brazil, again, this isn't 40 or 50,000 uh, husbands murdering their wives. These are the people who are living in or around favelas in slum areas. And the violence is associated very much with gang warfare, particularly over drug distribution. So uh, Owen will go into this in much greater detail. But to try to prevent uh, this kind of violence, you need to improve the capacity of the state, um, reduce the extent of tolerated violence. If you go back to the sort of uh, the uh, the ladder I had earlier, you know, let's get it back back near the top, where you know no state can prevent all act, all acts of violence within society, but you can try to uh, at least prevent organised open acts of violence. Uh, there's a need to disarm armed groups, enforce gun control laws. Um, again, a lot of these states actually have quite strict legislation. It just isn't being enforced. Um, and a basic facet of the functioning state is to be able to control arms use within its territory. But as Owen will, I'm sure, mention, you know, these, th this kind of prescription isn't uh, without problems. I mean, particularly when you're talking about improving the capacity of the state, what happens if this is a state which abuses human rights? Um, you know, that, that involves an awful lot of dilemmas for um, people on the outside is, you know, do you want to improve the capacity of the state which may, uh, may be committing acts of uh, extrajudicial violence on its own? And now I will hand over to it. Okay, I probably, in order, we'll, because we want to bring this to an end, I'll close that. Uh, I probably won't elaborate too much on that. I'll, I'll pick, leave those okay. for picking up the questions. And let me just, um, uh, again, re-pick up on my and get through to the final four. Um, but just to pick up, uh, just to highlight something which does link um, before I move to uh, what I was finally going to talk about, and that's that the challenge is that because we've got such a complex interplay between the technology and the access to arms and, uh, and the violences and, uh, and crime that, relay, uh, that you know, may result, uh, you've got very many intermediate options. So one of the themes of one of the chapters, for example, is the very different dynamics that leads then to really profound implications for human security, uh, urban governance, and a whole range of things is the difference, for example, between the Camorra and the Mafia, where they have different systems for the use and for the, for the misuse of armed violence in order to pursue their goals, one of which uh, privileges, uh, in the Camorra's case, the need for individual gang members to continually emphasize and demonstrate personally uh, their capacity to exert violence and therefore to be, need to be respected. It's a much more fragmented structure rather than the mafias uh, that uh, tend to reserve it and deploy it in much more strategic goals in order to mediate and negotiate uh, 
uh, much more carefully with the state. Now this plays through a little bit in relation to some of the points, uh, ju just to highlight it, in relation to what I'm just about to say, but also um, uh, Nick's last point. Uh, there's been a lot of debates, for example, if you're disarming uh, groups that feel insecure, will they ever allow themselves to be disarmed? How effective uh, uh, is that? And one of the key um, themes of this book is that, again, one, uh, it's really important to uh, uh, emphasize how significant it is to look at intermediate options. There is no evidence that where people have a large number of weapons and they continue to feel insecure, they're prepared to hand them all in on a promise, however good that promise is and however high the incentives are. On the other hand, there are really many, many evidences that you can change through, uh, well, uh, through um, uh, dynamics that actually are well attuned to the local structure of armed violence and use to make a dramatic difference to the extent of insecurity and violence that flows from that arms availability, even without collecting them all. Uh, in Cambodia, where I led a program for a long time, the big difference was did people carry them and have them readily available in their homes, or did they cache them and bury them in the woods nearby? made, uh, they were keeping them, it was an unsuccessful arms collection except there were sur surplus arms, but then they were not available and they were not on display when it came to so many different instances that previously were leading to armed violence and lots of insecurity, simply because in a sense they'd been put temporarily beyond use, where there was a family dispute, the husband had to go out and recash them and there was a worry about you know, quite what that happened, so it tended to uh, um, remain at a lower level of violence. So lots of intermediate ways in which one can affect things. And coming back to weapons collection and control, uh, the key evidence is actually that people are prepared to hand in those weapons that they're prepared to either see as surplus to requirements, and because, uh, you know, so they had three, they'll now keep one, <laughs> and the best one. <laughs> uh, and then they'll hide that just in case, because that's in a reserve, not necessarily to be displayed all the time. Um, but secondly, that there's an ongoing process. These aren't one-off processes. These are very much engaged with changes in social norms. Uh, there are, and this is linking with this di societal dynamism, where a society decides something needs to change, then a society, in some sense, the agenda setters in that society, they can change a lot. But they won't necessarily change the uh, primary features of whether a young man should own a weapon. But they can certainly have an awful lot of um, uh, influence really quickly whether that young man tends to fire the weapon, whether it's manly to use it, whether it's for ceremonial display, whether you fire in the air and therefore kill your relatives in celebration, because what goes up must come down, or whether you don't. All of those things turn out to be relatively malleable, because the interlinkage between uh, weapons and, and the symb societal symbolic value of those weapons is a much more nuanced thing, and much more manipulable and manageable and changeable by people that thoroughly understand that society, which are the people within that society. Um, but to come on to my final, uh, so that was just to highlight where this intersection, you know, really comes into play if one wants to have a really big impact on, um, uh, you know, uh, on actually improving things. Let me just fi finally just highlight another theme in the book and just make a few points about it, about the close interlinkage between uh, arms and armed violence and poverty of alleviation and development, which is a contested one and one that has seen a lot of evolution over the last 15 years. Now... Needless to say, uh, well, for all of you that are f familiar with development <laughs> aid agendas, for a very long time, part of the professional aid ethos was to keep well away from anything to do with politics, uh, conflict, work around conflict rather than work on it, uh, and uh, certainly keep away from um, you know, armed, uh, arms and armed groups. That was uh, sort of you know, a risky area. And there were all sorts of rationales for that, which um, have basically collapsed in terms of um, policy uh, mandates and or not collapsed, uh, they have transformed over the last 15 years into uh, the reverse, that nearly all uh, aid, professional aid program policy people, as it were, as well as um, practitioners would now recognize that they're deeply interrelated and that's a success and I just want to highlight two points about that success but then move on to, uh, you know, to contemporary issues. The dynamics of that success is a really interesting one <laughs> when it comes to arguments that need to be made in the interplay between research, the policy dynamic and a usable knowledge, good enough knowledge. It was fairly uh, um, uh, quick to, make, to find that cases would be established, uh, accepted by development actors, not only aid actors, I'm talking about people in their own country concerned about poverty rather than uh, uh, about, uh, necessarily about security. Um, that, Armed violence in the form of war and civil war is bad for development. That is a case that is a easily made, 
and B, um, oversimplified to begin with, and there's been a lot of research in the last 15 years to show that it's the indirect effects of that uh, violence that have really made a difference in terms of the scale, but still that impact is very high. What did need to be won very heavily between, as a, as a research argument, as a knowledge-based argument, was the case that uh, in severely affected countries which weren't suffering from war, uh, the insecurities and violence from armed violence in all of those countries that Nick highlighted, a similar phenomenon was at play. And there was an evolution where essentially in the lead up to the global agreement in the 2001, the program of action, there was a lot of rhetorical use of the interlinkage between development and small arms uh, by those that wanted uh, to argue the case to consolidate that agreement. <laughs> Once the agreement was had, and, you know, on a rather flimsy uh, research basis, basically. Uh, certainly, you know, people believed it, but it was not really there. But once uh, that agreement was in place, of course, the implementation process went forward. And if you want the resources to begin to implement, uh, then, of course, you're talking about moving uh, and working with development aid agencies, which are the ones with the billions. Uh, the big ministries are all concerned with development aid and economic aid and investment, not uh, community policing and so on in the developing countries. And so there became an issue of persuading those. And there was a lot of research, which uh, I was lucky enough to be very, you know, very, very closely involved with, uh, between 2000 and 2007, which was uh, investigating much more uh, carefully through case studies and through other things, the complex interlinkages between poverty alleviation and development and armed violence. And uh, what it showed was you can demonstrate it in many cases that it can have a really big impact on poverty. So I can elaborate on that in questions if you like. Perhaps the most surprising finding uh, for those that, not in retrospect, <laughs> but at the time, was that actually it's the perceptions of insecurity that make a much bigger difference than the actuality. There are many cases where uh, actually the levels of violence and insecurity are pretty low. I mean, they're high, but they're, they're you know, more than perhaps Norwegians would tolerate or British, <laughs> but still not that low. But the perceptions of insecurity, if you, send your, if you allow your daughter to go to school uh, and walk along that kilometer, what will happen to them? If, if there's the uh, risks of going to market because there might be gunfire, you might have your stuff taken, really has a, prof prime, a profoundly distorting effect on constraining human behavior on all of the key livelihood strategies and uh, developmental strategies to do with Millennium Development Goals that matter in fragile states. And where symbolic, even quite symbolic action to reduce sounds of gunfire or perceptions that something is changing, improving, which has to be, which is a perceptual thing. Are you hearing gunfire at night even if it's celebratory or not? <laughs> you know, um, or hunting, you know, uh, or whatever. When something has changed like that, it, there's been very clear um, process you know, research which showed that, that then communities felt able to do an awful lot of things that they were previously unable to do. Now, that has got really quite deep implications for most development programs because there are a lot of areas in the world uh, that uh, aren't labeled as severely affected by conflict in this sort of extreme sense of the favelas of Sao Paulo or, uh, you know, or <laughs> areas of uh, Nepal, where nevertheless ordinary people have those extreme perceptions of insecurity for people they care about often for, for people they have control, for their women, for their children, uh, for, uh, for whether they'll invest that hard-earned money in, uh, in something risky which somebody might steal from you if it's successful. And where a, a, a clear focus on trying to tackle that makes a difference. There's also been quite a lot of experience, um, so that was that one. There's been quite a lot of experience of the very nuanced and complex ways in which small arms programming and armed violence focused programming can directly provide very facilitative entry points and, uh, and mobilization points around which wider community recovery, livelihood strategies, and so on could be mobilized. It's around confidence building to whom? Confidence building to development agencies. Development agencies are very, including domestic development agencies, I'm not just talking about international ones, people are unwilling to move into areas, nurses, doctors, which have a reputation for insecurity. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's not just because they're more comfortable in the cities, it's more visceral, but it can have a very big impact where you can show that some process or initiative, there's good evidence for that in many countries, Mali, Nepal, uh, uh, Cambodia, and so on. An important focus for community mobilization. Insecurity communities don't feel that often they can mobilize without really high risk to try and improve police relationships or improve the accountability of the army. That sounds very political. 
Uh, but there's something about artifacts, <laughs> you know, a symbolic act of dealing with the weapons of institutions, preventing display, burning them in a celebratory way or something like that, uh, which, although, uh, which uh, there's been a lot of evidence that as an initial focus for community mobilization, it can then mobilize community and social capital in a way that can be deployed in other areas. So there's, uh, uh, and, so, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff here. On the other hand, we're, and this is my final point, we're in a, we're in a very interesting, good, but dilemmaful point at the moment to do with how to progress on this. Because we've now moved from the policy stage and the pilot scheme demonstrating stage to the stage where uh, if this is going to have a serious impact, it needs to be sort of um, from all those developing countries, governments that care about these things, and also development agencies that care. It's got to be some sense of a scaling up so it becomes mainstreamed across a whole range of areas. And there, to be honest, uh, it's proving extraordinarily challenging. Part of that is institutional resistance. Um, you know, you, people became heads of this or that programming not because of their expertise on this issue, but because they knew how to do irrigation schemes and so on. Um, uh, but it's not only that. There are real dilemmas in the mainstreaming on any cross-cutting issue, particularly a nuanced issue where it takes a lot to grasp. You know, you've got lots of different potential interactions between the availability of arms and the developmental challenges. You need a, a certain uh, quality of assessment before you can get to grips of how best to, to deal with it, uh, which mean that if you mainstream, <laughs> mainstreaming means really integrating with the big programs, the likelihood is that the people in control of the programs have very little familiarity and use and commitment to really understanding those things, life being hard. Uh, or, and if you don't mainstream and you leave them as ad hoc programs that get then coordinated or integrated or separate budget line programs, uh, then we all know the challenges of um, then actually coordinating or integrating those programs, particularly in terms of the rich follow-on. Uh, because uh, all evidence shows that one-off weapons reduction programs or control programs and so on have very limited impact on poverty alleviation. They can make a step change in terms of confidence building, but then they need to be flexibly followed through. And uh, for my sins, one of the other things I do is I'm chair of an NGO that works a lot on these things, Safer World. And uh, there's been a lot of experience of community safety and security programs, which are a very good focus for trying to get this multi-level community focus, but with internationals as well as state as well as locals sort of trying to get a good synergy going but it's still extremely formulaic and at risk of you know not quite working a final comment is that there's been a real effort which i'm very sympathetic to to try and frame this within an armed violence reduction type concept which is to say it's not always about weapons it could be about gangs it could be about security sector reform it could be about a whole range of other things so it's not necessarily about the weapons you should have a flexible framework but let's nevertheless focus on armed violence reduction as a sort of hegemonic framework, as it were, within which to pull all of these things together. There's now well elaborated OECD uh, DAC guidance on it. Um, uh, there is, um, and so in a sense, the policy framework is there. But in practice, it's proving extraordinarily impossible, <laughs> uh, extraordinarily difficult to use that framework as a way of uh, getting beyond those basic dilemmas. There's a rethink required at the moment, which we could talk about. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I'd just like to say that this is a very interesting, a very rich, um, uh, rich amount of research that's gone into this, and I think it, it shows also how important it is to actually be in the field and to, to heed the concerns of the community and perceptions of security and insecurity, rather than sitting at an institute or a university and writing about this, to be able to understand the multi-level approach that, that is so uh, important to solving this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.